All right, so welcome everyone. I'm Diana Diggs and I'm a Huron Pines AmeriCorps member serving at Michigan Nature Association or MNA as we usually call it. Um, I am hosting the webinar today with one of our regional stewardship organizers, Zach. Um, and we wanna thank you all for attending and we hope you're able to learn more about the conservation efforts happening for prairie fins in Michigan. So just one little tech thing before we get started. Um, some of you, I think, have figured out where the chat box is. Um, everybody's been saying what county you guys are in, which is great. Um, but in case you don't know where that is, here you can see that if you're on your phone, there's these three little dots in that green box, which will pop up those white bars and you can click the chat there. If you're on the computer, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, this bar will pop up and the uh, chat box is in the yellow box like you see here. Um, so we will have a Q&A at the end. Um, so feel free to type any questions in the chat box as we go. Um, and if we're unable to get to the question tonight, or we need more time to really get you a good thorough answer, um, we will follow up with any questions in an email to everyone. So here's just a little outline of the topics we'll be covering in the webinar. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Huron Pines AmeriCorps and Michigan Nature Association. Then we're gonna talk a bit about what a prairie fin is and why they are important. Um, as well as some of the plants and animals that you might see in these habitats. Then Zach's going to tell you about the restoration efforts that MA is doing, um, some of the challenges of that work, and how you can get involved and help MA's efforts to conserve and protect Michigan's natural areas. So, as I mentioned, I am a Huron Pines AmeriCorps member, um, and I just want to tell you a little bit more about that program. So first, a little background about AmeriCorps. It is a network of local, state, and national service programs that engage more than 70,000 Americans each year to help communities address issues involving health, education, environment, disaster services, and economic opportunity. Um, if you've heard of the Peace Corps, you can think about it in those terms, but your service is done here in America and not internationally. Huron Pines is a conservation nonprofit in Northeast Michigan. They began the Huron Pines AmeriCorps program in 2007 to help develop leaders in conservation. Um, at first, they only hosted AmeriCorps members at their site, and then they started expanding their program across Michigan. And now they typically have about 30 members providing service to conservation organizations statewide. Um, some of the host sites are DNR offices, conservation districts, land conservancies, and other environmental organizations. Um, and this is MA's first year as a host site. Um, and all these smiling faces um, are my fellow Huron Pines AmeriCorps members that I'm serving with this year. So as a Huron Pines AmeriCorps member, you serve 1,700 hours over the course of a 10-month term. During that time, you may plan and participate in events ranging from natural resources outreach and education to more labor intensive service like invasive species removal. Um, and also as members were given a chance to network in areas of interest, um, attend relevant conferences and seminars and serve under Michigan's natural resource leaders. Um, it's a really great program. If you or anyone you know might be interested, feel free to email me, give them my email, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone about it. So now we're going to talk a little bit about Michigan Nature Association, or MA. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the organization, um, so MA is a nonprofit membership based organization with headquarters in Okemos, Michigan. In 1951, Bertha Davendeck and a few of her friends started a group to study birds. Um, the group started with a mission to protect ecological diversity and to educate people about Michigan's diverse wildlife. Um, the following year, 1952, the group signed Articles of Incorporation, officially establishing themselves as a nonprofit. 
Since then, the mission of MNA has evolved, and today it is a commitment to the protection and maintenance of special natural areas throughout the state, as well as the rare and endangered plants and animals that reside in these areas. And it's also to promote a program of natural history and conservation education. To achieve our mission, we monitor, restore, and maintain over 180 sanctuaries. Um, I think the exact number right now is 187. Um, this makes us the largest statewide network managed by a nonprofit conservation organization in Michigan. Um, each of the nature sanctuaries is represented by a green dot on the map. So you can see the widespread distribution across the state. Um, we would love to know if any of you have visited or volunteered at one of the sanctuaries. So Rob, if you could please share the first poll. Um, and if you have visited any of them, feel free to type the name of the sanctuary in the chat box. Looks like most of you have. About half and half now almost. All right, I think Rob is sharing those results now. So 58% said yes, 42% no. That's great. We hope you guys are able to get out and see more of them. We've got some great spots. All right, so now we're gonna jump in to a little bit more about prairie fins. So in order to understand how prairie fins were formed, we need to understand some of the history of how Michigan's landscape was formed. So here you can see where the Midwest was covered by massive glaciers. Um, and approximately 10,000 years ago, um, the glaciers began their last retreat. And as they did, they collected lots of debris, rocks, and various types of sediment. Um, and as the glaciers melted, all this material was left behind and created these depositional land features, such as the moraines and the eskers. Um, these moraines are steep hills that formed um, from the glacial debris that was deposited. And then another feature that was formed um, were these kettle lakes. So as the ice sheets broke apart, um, the large pieces were left in place and they melted and leaving these various size uh, deposition, depression areas that became filled with water. And prairie fins are primarily um, occur where these glacial deposit features border areas of glacial outwash um, these chains or plains, these channels or plain areas here. And that type of landscape is primarily in the southern lower peninsula of the state. Hydrology is one of the key characteristics that separates fins from other types of wetlands. So whereas other wetlands get their water source generally from rainwater or surface water, Fins get their water supply from groundwater. Um, and this groundwater is rich in calcium and magnesium because it is filtered through the sand and gravel that was left behind by the glaciers. So the water enters the recharge area and then it comes out through springs and seeps in the fin. Um, and these can form small streams that connect with other streams and these generally contribute to the headwaters of a lot of Michigan's rivers. So now that we have a little background, um, let's look at what a prairie fin is. Um, so it is a groundwater fed wetland 
that has formed on top of the sand and gravel deposits that were left behind by the glaciers. The continuous supply of groundwater they receive keep the soil saturated throughout the year. And this causes a reduction of the bacteria that usually breaks down plant matter. Um, so this leads to this buildup of partially decayed plant material or peat. Um, so these are wetlands, but they're more specifically called peatlands. Um, and these fins are found throughout Michigan, um, but prairie fins are generally located in that southern lower peninsula area. And being in that region is what gives it another one of their unique characteristics. Um, and that is the diversity of vegetation that you see in prairie fins. So similar to other type of fins, they have sedges and other plants that are commonly found in wetlands, but they also have a large component of grasses and wildflowers compared to the other types of fins. And this is due to the location in Southern Michigan, which historically had a lot of prairie habitat. Um, so we see a lot more plants that we would typically see in tall grass prairie communities. So this increases the plant diversity, which also means it increases the diversity of the wildlife that we have in these habitats as well. And here you can just see some of the nature conservancy, some of the nature uh, sanctuaries that MA has that has these prairie fins present. So this leads us to why fins are important. Um, so in Michigan, fins have 500 times more rare plants and animal species than the average acre of land. So they are basically Michigan's equivalent to a tropical rainforest in terms of relative biodiversity. Fins support 59 rare species, 23 plant species, and 36 animal species. 25 of which are insects. Um, and this is largely attributed to the diverse flora of the mix of wetland and prairie species that inhabit these areas. So in Michigan, over 20% of the state's insects um, are of conservation concern, are associated with prairie fins. Um, and this includes the globally imperiled, the Mitchell satyr butterfly. Um, so Rob's going to share the second poll, um, and we are just wondering if anyone knows what percent of Michigan's land uh, do you think is thin? 5%, 1%, a Most people are saying a thousandth of a percent. All right. Thank you, Rob. And you would be correct. Fins make up only a thousandth percent of the land in Michigan. Um, so since the early 1800s, we have lost approximately 98% of these wet prairie habitats. Um, and just like we rank wildlife on a scale of their likelihood of extinction, we do the same for natural communities. And prairie fins are ranked as vulnerable to extinction on a global and statewide scale. So that's why protecting our remaining fin habitat is a top conservation priority in Michigan. As well as providing habitat for a broad diversity of plants and animals, fins also provide us with other ecological services. One is that they act as a sponge by storing and releasing storm and flood waters, which in turn helps prevent and reduce flooding. They also act as filters, so the plants absorb excess nutrients from things like agricultural runoff, and they provide clean water for streams and lakes. Fins are also carbon sinks, so through photosynthesis, plants remove the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, 
and it becomes incorporated into the plant tissue, tissue, which is eventually stored up to thousands of years in the organic peat soils of the prairie fens. They also act as a barometer that gauges the health of our groundwater. So if the fen is healthy, it's a good indication that our groundwater supply is as well. So next we're gonna look at indicator species of a fen. Um, but first, if anyone would like to take a guess at the identification of any of these species, feel free to write your guesses in the chat box while I talk a little bit about indicator species. Um, so an indicator species is an organism that lives in a certain type of environment. Um, so its presence or absence can tell us something about the environmental conditions that are there, such as is the soil wet or dry, is the soil acidic or alkaline? Um, and they can even help us assess the overall health of the ecosystem. So it looks like we've got some guesses in the chat. Great. All right, let's see. Let's see what each of these are. So first we have the tamaracks, second the shrubby sink foil, grass of Parnassus, the Virginia Mountain Mint, Poison Sumac, the Riddle's Goldenrod, Indian Grass, and Ohio Goldenrod. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, some of those species that we just looked at and also some other of the common and rare species that you might see in these prairie fens. So first is the common trees and shrubs of this area. First is the shrubby sink foil, which is a shrub around two feet or taller in the rose family. And the rare power chic skippling butterfly is known to nectar on these. <clears throat> Next we have the tamaracks, which is Michigan's only native deciduous conifer tree. Um, so when most conifers are evergreen, its needles do turn golden yellow in the fall and they drop off the tree. Um, these trees provide habitat for the rare insects, the Mitchell's satyr butterfly, and the tamarack's tree cricket. Next is the bog birch, which is a low shrub that is utilized by a variety of wildlife. Um, it's a host plant to many insects, including different katydids and the larva of the buck moths. Its buds and nutlets are also food for a variety of songbirds. Also poison sumac, um, it's a shrubby, a woody shrub or a small tree that's found in a lot of wet environments and it's part of the habitat where the Mitchell satyr can be found. All parts of the plant contain the oil that can cause an allergic reaction in some people. So here we have just a few of the herbaceous or non-woody plants that you'll find in this habitat. Um, there are multiple species of grass of Parnassus in Michigan. This one is the most common and widespread one. Um, it is found in high quality natural areas, so it's a good indicator for a healthy fin. Prairie drop seed is a grass of special concern in Michigan, and it's highly suspected, but um, it hasn't been completely confirmed that is a host plant for the endangered power sheep. Um, third is the tussock sedge. Um, so this is a major component of many wetlands across the state. Um, and they form these dense colonies um, that can provide excellent cover for birds and other wildlife. They are the host plant for several caterpillars and the sedge wren uh, feeds and nests in areas where they are a dominant species. Last is the black-eyed Susans, um, which is a widespread prairie wildflower um, that is a favorite of many pollinators. Um, it's also a nectar source for the power sheep skipperling. So one of the plant families that's found um, their home in Michigan's prairie fins are the orchids. Um, many of these unique flowers have very specific habitat requirements, so their presence help us assess the health of the prairie fins. This first one is the grass pink. Um, it's got these really vibrant pink petals that can be found in various wetland habitats throughout Michigan. 
The nodding lady tresses is the most common orchid in Michigan. Um, and it's a late bloomer with its white blooms generally not seen until August. Um, the showy lady slipper really lives up to its name. It's got these really large pink and white petals and it can grow up to three feet tall. The yellow lady slipper um, can live in a variety of environments um, except extremely dry ones. Um, and like many other orchids, these are eaten a lot by white-tailed deer. Another unique group of plants that we can find in prairie fins are the carnivorous plants. Um, so these are plants that get their nutritional needs by eating tiny invertebrates, um, which allows them to survive in these low nutrient saturated soils of fins. Um, and frequently seen in fin habitats are the pitcher plant, the sundews, and the bladder warts. So in 2015, the DNR, um, with the help of some other government and conservation groups, created wildlife action plans for different habitats in Michigan. So they created them with the goal of providing a common strategic framework for coordinating the conservation of wildlife and habitats in Michigan. And one of the ones that was put together is for fins, and they picked these six wildlife species to be the focal species. So the first one is the Mitchell Sater butterfly, um, which is a federally and state endangered uh, medium-sized brown butterfly with yellow ringed black eye spots. Um, their habitats are usually dominated by narrow-leafed sedges, scattered tamaracks, and poison sumac. The Powashik skipperling is a federally endangered and state threatened orange butterfly with these semi-triangular wings here, um, and they nectar a lot on black-eyed Susans, shrubby sink foil, and other wildflowers. Um, there's been a long-term population decline of more than 90% of these across their range, um, and the cause of the decline is still unknown, um, and they're currently found in only high-quality prairie fins. The Tamarack's tree cricket, um, is a species of special concern in Michigan um, and is globally rare. It's a long, narrow cricket that lives in a variety of wetlands in Michigan, basically any that maybe contain the tamaracks tree because that is where they lay their eggs. The federally threatened Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake is Michigan's only venomous snake but it is really shy and docile and it generally tries to remain hidden. Um, these rattlesnakes are found in wetland habitats that are usually also close to some upland areas. The Heinz emerald dragonfly is a federally and state endangered dragonfly that often occurs in wetlands with seeps or slow moving streams, which are needed for habitat for their larval stage. And last is the yellow rail. Um, this is a state threatened small secretive bird with a stocky body and a short tail. Um, they rely on fin and wet meadow habitats that are dominated by wiregrass, sedge, and other fine stemmed grasses and emergent aquatic plants. Um, so that sums up the plants and wildlife for prairie fins, and I am going to hand it over to Zach. Just give us a second to switch out our screen. Okay, guys. Are we all set? You guys can hear me? Good. Hello, my name is Zach McKenna. I am the Regional Stewardship Organizer for the Eastern Lower Peninsula, which is, if you look at the map, the funky area shown in blue. This evening, I will be discussing some ongoing restoration efforts occurring on m and sanctuaries, as well as the challenges that are associated with these projects. I will also discuss community outreach and what you can do to help. And as I've seen, there are a handful of our stewards and volunteers in the webinar, so it's nice to see you guys again. Thanks for joining us. 
So some of the challenges that we have that we will be discussing are alterations to hydrology, returning fire to the landscape, and of course, invasive species. As you can see here, one of our stewards, Carolyn, had gotten into a bit of a tussle with some multi-flora rows, which is never a good time. So some common target species include common buckthorn, glossy buckthorn, autumn olive, non-native phragmites, narrow-leaved cattail, and reed canary grass. I am able to break down my year based on seasonal growth and treatment times for these different species. For example, January through late March, I will be treating woody invasives such as the glossy buckthorn using a cut and treat method, cutting the plant at the base and using the herbicide at a higher concentration to apply it to the fresh cut. An example is shown to the right of the screen. When spring arrives, I will change my focus to the early risers such as the garlic mustard, which outcompetes a lot of our spring ephemerals. Treating woodies is less effective during the springtime due to sap flow and an inability to get the herbicide to properly absorb. Late spring through early fall, I will target species such as invasive phragmites, narrow-leaved cattail, and swallowwort. When fall begins to transition back into the cold weather, I will change my focus back to the woody invasives and the cycle continues. If you'd like to know more about MA preferred treatment methods, whether it's herbicide related or mechanical, please feel free to reach out to me after the webinar to discuss more in depth. So there are a lot of helpful resources out there. Um, I often refer to the MNFI field guides, such as the Invasive Plants of Aquatic and Wetland Habitats for Michigan, Invasive Plants in Michigan's Natural Communities. Uh, there are SISMA groups that can help you inform about um, local threats and treatment options. And then MISSIN is a great resource um, for identification and it allows you to report um, invasive species observations. Invasive species occurrence are broken down into a community type. You will find the friend category on the right hand side, and you will see some of the target species such as European fireweed and glossy buckthorn. Best survey periods are also provided, allowing you to properly schedule your monitoring and management efforts. Some species are evident year round, such as autumn olive. However, other species, such as the European fireweed, have a short survey period between July and September. Beaver activity can heavily impact the landscape, and fen complexes are not immune to that. Prolonged flooding can kill trees, shrubs, and many herbaceous plants, and results in the conversion of prairie fen to shallow ponds, emergent marsh, or wet meadows. Results can be seen using the Google Earth Timescale tool. Shown is an aerial image of the Big Valley Prairie Fen Complex taken in 2017. There is still plenty of viable habitat However, when compared to an image taken just 15 years prior, shows how rapidly this habitat can be overtaken. Note the yellow line depicting the current water level created by beaver activity, which has resulted in less suitable habitat for the fen dwelling species mentioned earlier by Diana. I'm gonna to toggle between these two photos so you can see, really see the impact and keep an eye on the water levels. So really, most of the land that the water is overtaking was historic fen habitat. Returning fire to the landscape. The prairie fen ecosystems have a number of fire-dependent species calling at home. These species have evolved with fire as a routine part of the system. In recent years, fire prevention and the introduction of invasive species have caused these typically open areas to fill in choking out native species. M&A has trained staff who, with the help of our awesome volunteer crew, are able to conduct burns at select fire-dependent sanctuaries. Shown here is a post-burn image of our caliber sanctuary. Vegetation returns to these burned or black areas fairly rapidly. Shown are some of the vegetation that has returned the following summer, just a few, mo or a few months after the burn was completed. Starting from the left, we have the showy lady slipper. At the top, we have the pitcher plant. At the bottom, the grass of Parnassus. And to the right, the fringe gentian. Um, so a lot of the indica indicator species that Diana had mentioned earlier on in the webinar. This is an example of a sample burn plan. Fire is a regular part of the prairie fence system and should be incorporated into a long-term management plan. The area to the south of the creek was burned early spring of 2019 and shown in the previous image. 
A future burn is planned for the lowland area just north of the creek. There are a lot of challenges associated with burning, some of which are the proximity to urban areas. Are there roads nearby? Have the neighbors been informed? Has the fire department been contacted? Um, crew availability, even though our burns tend to be on the smaller side, uh, having a good sized crew is always helpful. So that way the fire doesn't have a chance to get away from us. Weather conditions are always probably the biggest thing that we keep in mind. Um, a little wind can be helpful, but can quickly get out of hand causing cut fire to jump into areas we don't want it. Humidity may also affect how well an area will burn on a particular day. Clear skies will allow for quick smoke dissipation and rain in the forecast makes for an easy mop up duty. Consider sensitive species such as snakes, turtles, and insect life. Torching an area can have negative consequences. We aim for a mosaic or patchy burn in most circumstances. Walking the site beforehand to survey for and remove sensitive species such as turtles. And m and has developed a go-no-go -no -go checklist to ensure all safety measures have been accounted for and that the burn will be conducted as efficiently as possible. So if you'd like to know more um, about m and controlled burn efforts or are interested in volunteering in the future, please feel, me, feel free to contact me directly at zpacana at michigannature.org. Um, Rob is gonna pull up a, um, our third poll really quick, if you don't mind, Rob, and ask you about fire. Okay, so we have the results here, um, and actually that's pretty surprising. It seems like um, a third of you have actually participated in a prescribed burn in the past, which is great to hear. Um, and the other two thirds of you um, have not, and that's not surprising. It's not something you, know, you would get into every day. Um, that being said, if you are interested in the future, m and does have a volunteer burn um, program where you would be able to help out with some of our burns um, at Prairie Fen Ecosystems and some other fire dependent communities. And that could be you in the picture, which is pretty cool. We will discuss a few different ongoing projects that m has going on at our Big Valley Nature Sanctuary, including an invasive species management effort, native seed collection and planting, and land acquisition to further protect the sanctuary. Okay, so I found an invasive. Now what? Even if the observed uh, invasive was only one or two specimens and could be treated right then and there, it is still wise to document the location as a reminder to keep an eye out over the coming years. Shown is, is an example of how we communicate with fellow staff members, volunteers, and even contractors. Using Google Earth, we can create polygons based on your observations in the field Creating these maps allows you to communicate your observations and allows for long-term management without forgetting where things were. This project was contracted out using this map as a reference. Contractors were asked to spray the dense areas shown in green and hand wick the thinner patches shown in orange. Hand wicking can greatly reduce accidental overspray and save vegetation undergrowth such as the shrubby sinkopoil. our Rebecca planting project, or in this case, the brown-eyed Susan. Native seed is oftentimes gathered directly from a site instead of a purchased seed mix to maintain the genetic diversity that is unique to this particular area. Seed was gathered from the brown-eyed Susan in 2019 and propagated by the wild-type nursery in Mason. These were planted in the fen area to help support pollinator activity. So land acquisition. In 2020, m a was able to acquire the polygon shown in orange, further protecting the sanctuary by maintaining interconnectedness to other viable habitats. Big Valley Nature Sanctuary has been pieced together between 1995 and 2020 from 10 different parcels. The current acreage sits at about um, 192. Um, however, the additional acreage protected by North Oakland Headwaters Land Conservancy as well as the Young Family Conservation Easement, pushes the total acreage to well over what MA would be able to protect. Q 
community outreach. I will now jump into some of our community outreach efforts because without people like you, this would all be a lot more difficult. Volunteers are asked to participate in a number of management efforts, including invasive species removal, rare species surveys, bridge and boardwalk construction, boundary marking, and really just about anything else that we would do at a sanctuary. Certain volunteers are asked to go above and beyond taking on the title of steward. Stewards are asked to monitor the sanctuary, lead volunteer work days, and act as a caretaker to the sanctuary. They are our eyes and ears in the field and oftentimes report issues as they first arise. Here we have John, steward at Lakeville Swamp in Oakland County, giving us a tour of an area he has looked after for about a decade. My name's John Benke and I am the steward at Lakeville Swamp and I'm currently there I'm in the sedge meadow part of the prairie fen. You can see lots of typical plants that grow here, tamaracks, bog birch. Right now in flower are some brown-eyed Susans and some fringed loose strife. I, I can see um, where some swamp betony is growing and there'll be in a couple weeks some swamp blazing star, grass of Parnassus, um, and then even further into September the fringe gentians and all kinds of four or five different kinds of asters. It's an amazing place that is definitely worth keeping and protecting and taking care of. Uh, this area here is fairly low maintenance. It's, it's probably too far off the beaten track to have a lot of invasives. We do have right here an occasional Phragmite, but um, those are mostly closer to Rochester Road, which kind of cuts the sanctuary in half. The other half is uh, where the Cedar Swamp is and the Oak Barrens. Uh, so every time I come out here and I come through this very wet overgrown area with poison sumac and with a lot of other trees and shrubs and come out into this open area, I, I just sort of feel like I've come out into like a big arena and, where some great event is happening or, or a concert hall or something. It's just. There's something about it that every time you come, no matter when, from May through October, you're gonna see some unusual plants and uh, of course some birds and the occasional deer. But it's definitely worth saving and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. m a has partnered with a number of groups to lead quality educational hikes within our sanctuaries. We offer numerous different ways to explore the sanctuaries in a guided setting, whether it's a plant ID walk, a mushroom foray, a birding tour, or a snowshoe hike. All can be great ways to take in the sanctuary or what the sanctuaries have to offer. And oftentimes our stewards, such as John, will volunteer to lead these hikes. Shown here is Sister Marie, secretary for the Michigan Mushroom Hunting Club, leading an interpretive hike at our Parsons Nature Sanctuary in Clare County. MA has long had a focus on engaging and supporting the next generation of conservationists and naturalists, which is why we are so excited about our School to Sanctuary program. This is a great program that connects schools to nearby nature sanctuaries. Past programs have included MA staff giving classroom presentations having students visit sanctuaries, and allowing students to get some first-hand experience with stewardship. The goal for School to Sanctuary is to provide meaningful outdoor, place-based education experiences for students. And to that end, we're always looking for opportunities to connect with teachers and schools. Shown here is a group from the Addison High School being led into Goose Creek Grasslands by m stewardship coordinator, Rachel 
with the intent to conduct stewardship efforts within the prairie fen habitat. And here we have our reference page. Thank you for joining us this evening and participating in our webinar series. If you would like to reach out to volunteer, become a member, or just to learn more, feel free to email either Diana or myself using the contact information listed.